and we may begin. I'd like to thank the English majors Larry Jacobs and Michael Torpesson for their willingness to take a chance on an Inuit art movie, and for tucking my presentation into a program that had been working in the works for over a year and always was already bursting at the seams with talk and events. I would also like to thank Thalia Nickens and Lou Yontine for the great feedback they gave me on an earlier draft of the presentation for which they were willing to serve as test subjects, guinea pigs as it were. And finally, I'd like to thank my husband, Robert Switzer, for editorial help and image wrangling. We begin. Today I will be presenting an analysis and an appreciation of the paintings and collages which over the last five years, the Toronto-based Inuit artist, Lloyd Kutana, has added to his ongoing body of work in stone. But before we get rolling, I need to thank Aaron Boyd, the manager of Toronto's gallery artist, for providing most of the images I will be presenting and much of the history. Housed in a heritage building on Girard Street, the Gallery Artist is a non-commercial exhibition and workspace for art. It regularly exhibits Kukana's carvings and occasionally his 2D work, and provides a workstation for his 2D projects if he arrives sober, as here. The cross on his forehead is not the detritus of Ash Wednesday, it's a prison tattoo he acquired while incarcerated in the North for cold cocking an ant in a drunken family brawl. Keep an eye out for it. The tattoo appears in many places and guises in Kukana 2D. Executed mostly in Brazilian soapstone, Kukana's carvings are well known in the Inuit art world. In spring of 2008, Kukana snagged the cover of Inuit Art Quarterly, doubling the prices of his carvings the while. In the better galleries, the carvings can be found stickered in five figures. His 3D works have proven particularly popular in the U.S. In 2016, when the Midwest Center Inuit Art Society mounted at the Kenosha Public Museum an Inuit art exhibition drawing on members' collections, more works by Kukana were on display than any other artist, though a Kudlo Kudlot made the cover of the show catalog. Kukana's paintings and collages, on the other hand, have been gang rejected by every commercial outlet, every gallery and auction house, but one. Toronto's Maslach McCoy Gallery now shuttered. So Kukana has been reduced to selling his paintings at weekly Toronto flea markets. The 2D work has had some play on the internet. Still, many people may not be familiar with Kukana's painting, so let me initially provide you with, as it were, a witness sampler of his 2D work. I'll flip through a few examples to give you a general feel for the lay and range of the terrain. The works vary widely in dimension, though none is huge. They range from the size of a half a sheet of typing paper to that of a card cable top, but the typical work is about 16 by 12 inches. Some works, as here, are a little more than dashed off sketches, but sometimes even simple ones can pack quite a visual punch. Here we have a well-worked-out rhythm and balance between positive and negative spaces. The work can be quite complex, and in general the rule of Kukana is, the more complex, the better. The collages are often quite complex. There's that tattoo. A goodly number of the works combine both painted and collage elements. Acrylics and collage are Kukutana's favorite 2D media, but he's always trying out new things with mixed results. Recent efforts with pastels have been very successful, and he likes mixing the brightness of acrylics with the matte finishes of pastels. On the other hand, recent experiments with, yes, glitter glue, are flops, at least in my mind. The dark specks here against the purple are glitter. When it comes to subject matter, Kukana is a serial painter. He generally works out several variations of theme before moving on, but then often will revisit a subject that he has laid aside for a while. One series is devoted to anukshuk transformations, anukshuks that spring to life as birds or wolves or people. Another series depicts two-headed dogs. Perhaps you can help me out with this. <coughs> My hunch is that the series has something to do with the Kibiak legend. 
And these two Baker Lake printings from the 1970s strongly suggest that there's some connection between Kivia and two-headed dogs. But I've not been able to find a literary source linking them, ideas and sources are welcome. Kupai does some portraiture. Here is a painting of one of his friends. I'm not sure what the friend thinks of the canine elements with which the painting assumes him. <laughs> Coupon has done some vibrant his face in your face self-portrait. <coughs> Here, Sedna is executed in silver paint, while Coupon himself is laid out in gold. He can be, as we will see, rather full of himself. And there's a whole series of radiant, or at least radiating, faces of people from his imagination. Not a few of the Kuptana's 2D work draw on imagery familiar from his 3D work, as here, where a figure, frequently a bear or a dog, dances on the moon, which in turn is mounted above a base, in this case an igloo. Here, a decade earlier in stone, is an uncle of his has made a shaman's flight to the moon. And here, a bird man dances on both the crescent and a face of the moon, or something, and perhaps also in the light of the moon. A very successful complex image executed in just a few strokes. In style, the work can be bright and bold. It can be funky and fun and weird. There's the tattoo again. It can be playful and childlike. Even adorable or not so much. <laughs> Note that both the paintings have the same subject, a white bird, the two kutanas, as it were. The disparity between the galleries embracing the carvings while dismissing the painting is striking, since the painting boosts the energy, wonder, intensity, and strangeness found in the carving. But explanations for the rejection are not far to seek. For starters, Painting barely has a toehold in Inuit art traditions, though Nancy Saunders seems to be working on making it a handhold. Second, in Canada, there is no tradition of the art movement that in the United States and Europe has, with great commercial success, branded itself as outsider art, visionary art, art brute, complete with dedicated galleries, art fairs, and magazines. Yet Kupana's paintings would fit into the outsider art tradition beautifully. Self-taught, edgy in content and sourcing, out there, funky, bold in effects. Third, many of Kupana's 2D works, especially early ones, are executed using materials that are worrisome from the point of view of preservation. And in any case, decidedly non-standard for most galleries, though again, not so unusual in the world of outsider art. Some are executed on cardboard, on foam core, on found wood. Note the saw or hatchet marks along the edges here, or on ceramics, or on whatever's at hand. Finally, some, many people find Kupkana's 2D work scary. Scary to the point of disturbing, off-putting, even horrifying. When I acquired art and circulated this photo of moi holding it, Several Inuit Art Society members and many other Inuit Art fans all said basically the same thing. Interesting, but how can you stand to live with it in your home? <laughs> <laughs> we do. <laughs> Not since New Rasmussen handed paper and pencil to the Netsulik shaman Anarkot, has the depiction of the spirit world's arrival in everyday life been as scary as in the 2D work of Lutukana. Many of his works seem to come from the same fraught metal states that produced Goya's black paintings. The work of the 22-year-old Jackson Pollock, just prior to it being institutionalized for mental illness, and these masks made by veterans suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder. In 1964, at the height of the Cold War, 250 miles above the Arctic Circle, Kutana was born in the shadow, literally in the shadow of the Cape Perry Blue Line Station. Here, at the northernmost fringe of the continental America, the station stands ever expecting thermonuclear incoming. This shot shows, at far upper right, the Inuit workers' housing 
out there beyond the station's wing road. Kuptana's father <coughs> worked at the station long term, and later Kuptana did a dip too. So he lives, we might say, under the sign of impending apocalypse, and that feeling pervades the plurality of his paintings and collages. Let's look at one in some detail to see how this thought plays out. Take the painting that Aaron Boyd, with a nod from Kuptana's multivalent laugh, has baptized I Like Picasso, something on the title of it later. The painting depicts in lurid impasto, at once seductive and repulsive, gilt, pink, turquoise, a spiraling star or galaxy that as it rotates towards the viewer begins cutting like a circular saw into a cosmic skull whose lamprey-like teeth seem poised to bleed the universe dry. In Kuptana's paintings, as in his carvings, mouths are always fixedly round, incapable of laughter, incapable of smiling. <coughs> Devil's horns and cold ringed eyes further flag the spirit's intent. Yet comedy, too, that of startling juxtaposition, joins the frame. Two pairs of goofy overlapping creatures fill out the remaining space. Towards the bottom left, two white Janus faced profiles of indeterminate species, perhaps birds, but in any case with grossly downstretched snouts share a single eye. Above these grotesque faces hover two canine muzzles in blue. They too share a single eye. In right, in right profile, one has its mouth open. The other, looming in from one quarter left profile, from behind the gyrating star, is, yes, Charles Schultz's Snoopy, <laughs> whose familiar big black nose doubles as the other dog's mouth. Even comedy does not relieve horror, it makes the horror a mocking one. In filling out the canvas with absurdity, the painting leaves no spot on the floor where the drunken viewer can plant a foot in order to stop the room from spinning. Humor here works like an otlottle or throwing board. Though it initially points in the opposite direction to its sphere, it greatly enhances the sphere's deadly thrust. For Kutana, the universe, all giddy and grim, is stacked against us. But if we grew up with the stories of Sedna and Scylla and Castle Romeo, how could we see it, have it any other way? My path to Kutana 2D was through this drawing by him on a playing card, a framed enlargement of which was on display at the gallery Arcturus when I went there because I'd heard rumors that it frequently had on a sculptures worked into its ever diverse, frequently changing displays. At the time, I didn't know that he'd produced any 2D work, and the card was not labeled, but obviously, in light of his 3D work, it had to have been by him. I asked after the card, and it turned out that it was part of a whole deck of drawn and collage playing cards. All the card's collage elements are cut from a highly eclectic book titled Eskimo Art and surveying northern art from old Bering Sea cultures right up to the date, book's date of publication, 1973. A fair reading of the cards is that Kuptana is mocking the entire concept of Inuit art. Note the belittling circumcision, shall we call it, of the E from the rest of Eskimo. Eskimo becomes schemo, upper right. And the playing cards, when collaged with snippets of Inuit art, literally turn Inuit art into a game. Euchre anyone? <laughs> Kuptana regularly refers to Inuit art as Eskimo art, as though he is referring to a charming antiquity or being gratuitously incorrect in the face of contemporary Canadian usage. According to Aaron Boyd, he frequently deflects being called an Inuit artist. This is an old and understandable, but a somewhat tedious fight fought by members of many different culturally marked groups. Women, Jews, gays, African Americans, and all the other others. I'm not a fill-in-the-blank artist. I'm an artist who just happens to fill in the blank. To me, this always trails a scent of both self-loathing and self-aggrandizement. At a minimum, Inuit subjects pervade Kutana's to me work. Figures from 
Inuit myths and objects in Inuit material culture pop up as core representations in the majority of his paintings. He's not an outsider looking out into this culture, or as the narrator of the movie Magnolia puts it, you may be through with history, the past is never through with you. What's most important on this score, though, is that Kuktana's paintings, whatever their degree of ethnic inflection, have enough substance to them, enough cultural hooks, to be a vehicle for helping get Inuit art taken more seriously in the contemporary art world as art pure and simple, not just as a niche interest in a niche market. The works invite being discussed within the going thought styles and discourses that make up contemporary art criticism. Current Inuit art criticism continues to be mired in a biographical artist-focused tradition that died out in mainstream art criticism in the 1980s. Contemporary art criticism, yes, call it postmodern, does not focus on the individual maker or the self-contained beautiful object. Both beauty and uniqueness are out. Its concerns are with social, political, and cultural forces that shape a constructed world and which in turn are influenced by such construction, with, along the way, a healthy appetite for the self-reflectivity, irony, and self-contradiction of the very sort that we see in Kuptana's playing card set, which both literally and literarily deconstruct in with art. If culture is fissured and fractured and self-contradictory, artworks will be too. But enough pontificating, and at the possible cost of contradicting what I've just said, Let's ask, what was Carver Kuptana's path to Kuptana 2D? In the fall of 2008, Kuptana appeared on the doorstep of the gallery Arcturus with a load of carvings and charm. <clears throat> he was taken in and became a satellite artist associated with the gallery. The gallery's exhibition room sometimes doubled as atelier. And one day, artist in residence Deborah Harris took some of Kuptana's carvings as subjects for charcoal sketches. Here's one on screen. These paintings of his carvings jolted him. He went home, got some paint, tore apart a coffee table, and painted the top of it, nail still sticking out of the sides. This is it, his first painting. It's extraordinary and cast the template for his future 2D work. As in the case of the 3D work, his signature 2D style crystallized early on. But the first thing that catches the eye in the new work is a flash from the past. The red blast centered at the top is a configuration familiar from his carvings. Two heads attached back to back facing in opposite directions. Works in this configuration are commonly thought, probably correctly so, to be transformation pieces. What's being depicted is a transformation of one species into another, in this case, perhaps bear into monster. The new art journey begins with the brown figures that flank the red ones. Here we have two or possibly three creatures represented through the use of negative spaces. The brown is not paint. It's the wood of the coffee tabletop showing through the surrounding black paint. The use of negative spaces to produce interlocking figures, often in profile, is common in Kuktana's paintings and is the artistic trope that most clearly distinguishes the paintings from the carvings. This small painting with collage shows vividly Kuktana's advanced use of negative spaces. The foreground consists of two figures. The one on the right is a dancing spirit bear, and on the left is a mysterious figure tilting, no surprise, away from the bear's wailings. But then the negative spaces created by the two foreground figures are used to represent three more creatures in profile. Filling the, spa filling the space in the middle between the bear and the mystery figures is a caribou. Note the miniature rack of antlers. Then, tucking in from the upper margin is some sort of bird. If it were electric pink rather than electric green, flamingos might come to mind. <laughs> then, coming in from the right side is a human face, or at least I think Homo sapiens alone have noses like this one, and what is likely to be a hairdo. 
Kutan's constructions of profiles and negative spaces forms the visual equivalent of interlocking pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. They are patches all lying in the same plane, one that just happens to be the picture pane of the canvas itself. As such, they imbue his painting with a perspectiveless flatness, a characteristic which is perhaps the most distinctive trait of Inuit graphic art in general. In their approach to design, Kutana's paintings are as squarely in the Inuit graphic tradition as the sculptures are in the Inuit carving tradition. These are the distinctive painterly strategies deployed on the top half of Kutana's first painting. Let's just look at the equally extraordinary bottom half. Here we, here we find a pile of eyes. They can be read separately as depictions in profile of five F5 creatures, mostly birds. Or they can be read collectively as a single three-eyed figure, possibly a bear or dog, facing forward but slightly to the viewer's left, with mouth agape and lower teeth bared. The refracted eyes can't help but make one think of cubism. But cubism, especially analytical cubism, is rigidly rectilinear. So let's call Kutana's cubism curvy cubism. But in any case, the refracted eyes help explain why Aaron Boyd has chosen to baptize a whole series of Kutana's paintings by like Picasso. The second of the series is on screen, and here is the fourth which, however, unlike the earlier ones, alludes to a particular painting on a Picasso. Kutana created only one other painting in 2010, or rather half a painting. He not infrequently begins projects which he does not finish. What you see here is a painting on particle board attached to a larger, repurposed, <laughs> framed oil landscape acquired at a thrift store. Before, attach, before the attachment, Kuptana did most of the painting on the particle board, though its background was mostly pink, since Kuptana, with limited funds, had run out of dark colors. Kuptana handed the project over to the boy, who fused the two works, painted in across both the black snow reflect background, added at front and center the grayish ghost-like figure, and removed four-fifths of a red tongue that was sweeping up the left side of the particle board. Kuptana applauded the removal, declaring, I'm no more a so. Perhaps he, <laughs> perhaps he had this long tongue painted by Norvell more so particularly in mind. Both of Kuptana's paintings of 2010 were supposed to be shown that December in a pop-up exhibit at the gallery art that the gallery Arcturus mounted at a satellite space it ran several years on Queen Street East called City Gallery. But because of the nails in the coffee tabletop substrate were declared a public hazard, the first painting was removed from the show before the opening. So this half painting was Kukana's 2D world premiere. Two years passed before Kukana took up brush and paint again. Upon Kutana completing one of many stints at rehab, Aaron Boyd provided him with painting supplies to see what might happen, possibly give him a new direction, one that would engage him more directly with the activities of the gallery. It worked. Right out of the blocks, the new 2D work was exciting and intense, and Kutana has kept it up up to the present, caroming around the twixt and between painting, carving, and lost weekends, lost weeks, sometimes lost seasons. His social workers no longer see rehab as a practicable option for him. 2012 also marked the year that Kupana began collaging, sometimes in conjunction with working groups at Gallery Arcturus, which always has one exhibition space devoted to collages. I will focus on one, titled Torso, which was produced in such a working group. The basic materials for the group were provided by Aaron Boyd from a repurposed book of paintings by the French expressionist George Rouault. The collage incorporates bits of three Rouault paintings, one each from three of Rouault's favorite subject matters. The three subjects are floral arrangements in frames, 
faces of circus clowns and stories of Christ usually suffering. So the basic materials are horror, a crucifixion, humor, and a precious beauty verging on kitsch. How could such a congress of possibilities not trigger something fantastic from an artist with Kuptanus record for humor, horror, and cuteness? The torsos and attenuated legs are recycled from the naked arms of a depiction of Christ being mocked. The face is cut from Wells painting English Clano, then tilted a bit and multiply collaged over with luscious blonde locks and watchworks for brains. The torso proper seems to have been clipped from a male pinup calendar or such. The fourth subject matter favored by Rouault is prostitutes. And something like this is what Kupton has made as an amalgam of the other three. The collage determinately alludes to the 19th century genre painting known as the OLS, in which a reclining nude courtesan is posed, spread out, with the very purpose of display and appreciation. Call it salon porn. Only here in the 21st century OLS, a reclining male nude replaces a reclining female nude. The posed posies at the gentleman's side invite a direct comparison to that most famous of odalesque, Manet's Olympia. In each painting, Manet is saying, I'm a flower plucked for your delectation. Michael Forpesson, in his essay for the Kenosha Public Museum in the Art Catalog, is the first critic to have pointed out culturally anomalous gender representations in Kupkana's carving. For example, a pair of males replaces the traditional female pairings in a throat singing competition. Male pairs had song competitions, but the performances did not involve singing simultaneously nor mouth to mouth. <clears throat> the conditions for acceptable gender anomalies in traditional Inuit culture, though, are quite narrow, and cuptominous anomalies do not fit them. The general rule in Inuit culture is that a person of one sex may, in a tight pitch approaching the press of necessity, and with a view to the general good, adopt a sex-linked social role assigned to a sex different than his or her own. For example, if a male sires seven sons in a row, seven daughters in a row, and no sons, it's acceptable in order to fend off starvation. Read that again. If a man sires seven daughters in a row, it's acceptable in order to fend off starvation that he teach the daughter, one of the daughters how to hunt. Though in traditional Inuit culture, being a hunter is the central defining characteristic of what it means to be a man. But the Kokana collage were not operating under this dispensation. No pinch generating exceptional circumstances is present. Here, rather, desire and delight are in play. In keeping with the conventions of the Odalesque, we have a male posed as an object of sexual delight for a culturally presumed male gaze, male viewer. So we have two gender violations going on here, at least in traditional Western eyes. A male depicted as passive and another off-screen, presumed to have same-sex desire. But there's no press of necessity here, only allure and delight. No wolf rings in the meat caches calling for extraordinary measures. The configuration of desire in torso is unique in my knowledge of Inuit art and legends. There are other gender anomalies in Kuptana's collage work. Here we have a gender sandwich, a male torso layered between a female head and a female leg. Though the winter Sedna festivals involve male shamans performing with some female accoutrements, the bodily hermaphrodism of this collage is again unparalleled in my knowledge of things Inuit. In his collages, Kuptai is wandering far into the southern world in its contemporary gender games. Inuit art at large has primarily taken interest in southern subjects that derive from white's material culture, especially those parts of it enabled by <coughs> internal combustion engines and electricity. So we have snowmobiles, ATVs, choppers, cars, helicopters, airplanes, motorboats, televisions, telephone poles, freezers, iPods, and so on. But Kutana, in contrast, 
is interested in white, not in white folk material culture, but rather in their distinctive ideas, social forms, art movement, and popular culture. <laughs> Remember those eyes, those all penetrating, all devouring eyes? A recurring theme in Kupana's work is the 19th century sourced cultural form of universal surveillance symbolized by the all-seeing eye and institutionally embodied in Western culture in Jeremy Bentham's panoptic all-seeing prison, in which from a central tower, a single pair of eyes can see everything that every prisoner does. Here's Kuptana's version of it, an anukshuk popped by an all-seeing eye. Normally think of an anukshuk as an object, its essence is to be seen, viewed by travelers and caravans. But here it's a subject, an agent, a viewer. And there's no need for stacked prison cells here. Just imagine the view that a nookshuk mounted eye would have on Kate Perry. Here it is. Nothing would escape its gaze. The paranoid vibe of the work is reinforced by the fiery tongue beaks flanking the eye, its enforcers perhaps. Here the all-seeing eye is ghostly, haunting, not even your dreams will escape its gaze. And here, shades of Edgar Allan Poe or the Borg, someone is entombed within the all-seeing eye as it looks to devour the universe. You will be assimilated. Resistance is futile. <laughs> Kutana has taken several dives into distinctively American pop culture, dives so deep, so deep as to be unparalleled in Inuit art. Kupana painted this homage to the polyvalent rock star Prince after Prince overdosed in the spring of 2016. The memorial painting depicts Prince as at once childlike and bedeviled. Sound familiar? The chords from Prince's Fender Stratocaster are flower powered, and as forward facing visage is painted the colors of candy, but a wolf or such bites into him from the upper left while a red devil confronts him at lower right. The devil's menace seems to be winning out over innocence. In another cubistic gesture, Prince is, has a second face. In right profile, one that mirrors the devil's profile. Prince's elbow rests atop a black-winged white slab that could easily be read as a tombstone, one whose black text simply but exhaustively reads X, crossed out, canceled no more. If the X object at the lower left is a tombstone, perhaps the mysterious ladder-like object at upper right hints at something salvific. If so, it would be in keeping with Kupana's title for the picture, Her Pal Wayne, a misspelling of the title of Prince's most famous song, one that sings of efforts to maintain faith in God and humanity as the world ends in apocalypse. The purple of the rain is a mix of the red of our blood and the blue of the heavens. But when I asked Aaron Boyd if Kupana was religious at all, his answer was a blunt, hell no. <laughs> Kupana has taken an even deeper dive into American pop culture, paradoxically by way of Van Gogh's The Starry Night. How so? He's used the famous painting as a backdrop for his commercially most successful series of paintings, ones that superimpose Snoopy and his doghouse front and center over the 1889 painting. But the idea for the pairing of famous dog and famous stars is not original to Kuptana. He got the idea, swiped it, from an early 2000 advertising campaign by the insurance company MetLife, which licensed Snoopy as its mascot for some 30 years. Note that the ad uses the Van Gogh painting as just an ex any example of an old master, which in art historical terms it actually isn't, but no matter. What's important as far as the ad goes is that it's just any old famous painting. Kupana steals the idea, immature poets imitate mature poets steal, and makes it his <laughs> own. Of the 30 members of Kupana's open-ended Snoopy Starry Skies series, this painting is the most complex that I'm aware of. 
Usually in this series, the alignment of Kutana's star to Van Gogh's is nonchalant. Sometimes a merely gestural, if still obvious, reference to the famous painting. But here, Kutana very carefully matches up the stars, though at one point his forehead tattoo stands in for one of Van Gogh's stars. Kutana is, as it were, Snoopy's astral projection, his essence, his soul, while Snoopy, in turn, is Kutana's emanation, his presence on the material plane of existence. With this paint, painting's exacting alignment of stars, Kutana invites additional detailed comparisons with of its appropriation to its source. And this is what we get when we take up the invitation. Snoopy is being cast as a shaman. His doghouse replaces Van Gogh's church. In the net life ad, the substitution was a mere accident because the Van Gogh itself was an accident. Any old master would do. But the very same substitution without alteration, when Kutana is viewed as part of the context, remember that tattoo, becomes a matter of design. What makes for religion in France makes for shamanism in the North. And if there's any doubt that Snoopy is a shaman, here we have substituting for the cypresses that raised the earth to the heavens on the Van Gogh canvas, a canine or perhaps lupine helping spirit who sweeps up and protectively over Snoopy, accompanying the sky in trance. From the source painting, we know that the star at the uppermost right is actually the moon, no crescent. Before becoming a mascot for MetLife, Snoopy was the official mascot for the safety programs of NASA's Apollo missions and informally served as the mascot for the entire United States effort to send humans to the moon. Here, Snoopy's familiar is already halfway there. <laughs> and say, what's going on down here at the lower right? Van Gogh's land has been replaced by an ocean that in turn is filled with an imposing, vengeance-seeking fish. Soo Snoopy is super shaman. He's so stupendous that he can, faithful and true, simultaneously travel to both the cosmic planes where shamans usually travel in their quest to help humanity, to the moon and to the vengeful sea goddess Sedna. As we've seen, Kukana identifies with Snoopy, whose seance is held under the sign of Kukana's sign of the cross. Here, the non-religious Kukana creates a messianic persona for himself. Once when things were not going well with him at Galilee Arcturus, were devolving towards violence and the police had to be called, he stormed out just in advance of their arrival, shouting on his way out the door, I am God. So grand, and yet what a hoot, Inuit artist as iconic all-American dog on the moon. What in the end are we to make of the bundle of at least seeming contradictions that are played to on an artist? Are we to conclude that there are two irreconcilable artists here, that this artist, or at least his art, is bipolar and schizophrenic? Not quite. Consider the greatest, but the least discussed and represented of the Inuit divinities, Scylla. The spirit of the air, weather, the outdoors, of the cosmos, of existence in general, of breath, and so of light, of what is fundamental. Scylla is sometimes figured as the baby giant Norsuk, who, like Sedna, is at core bent on revenge against humans. In his case, because humans killed both of his parents, mocked him, and left him abandoned to die, at which point he ascends to the heaven to become Scylla, mirroring Sedna's descent into the water world to become the sea goddess. Starvation-inducing storms, sometimes months long, result from Narsuk's unhitching his diaper and letting it flap about. But Scylla also has a more abstract, numinous, yet mostly in personal form, especially in Alaska, from which Kupana's immediate ancestor hailed. The Nunivak Island shaman Najaknek describes Scylla to Rasmussen as the upholder of the universe, of the weather, in fact, all life on earth. So mighty is a speech to man that it comes not through ordinary words, but through storms, snowfall, rain showers, the tempest of the sea, through all the forces that man fears. Or, 
Through sunshine, calm seas, and small, innocent, plain children who understand nothing. When times are good, Scylla has nothing to say to mankind. He has disappeared into his infinite nothingness and remains away as long as people do not use light. No one has ever seen Scylla. His place of sojourn is so mysterious that he is with us and infinitely far away at the same time. Scylla, then on revenge, is present and speaks to humans only when declaring and punishing their evils. So fundamental being is present to people only as destruction and retribution. Yes, it seems, the world is stacked against us. One of the voices through which Scylla is present and speaks is storms and squalls. Another is calm seas, and no surprise that Scylla, because Scylla himself is a baby, the innocence and playfulness of children. This fractured, exhaustive unity of existence is the vision at the core of Kukana's work. Innocence and laughter are an expected part of the universe's sinister portent. The explanation for the macabre, twisted, funny world of Kukana 2E is not that Kukan is crazy, it's that he's in him. The shaman Ajaknak was able to wrestle into helping spirits almost all of the monsters he encountered and later drew for Rasmussen. It remains to be seen with the Kukana who lives a rough, sometimes unbathed, sometimes beggar's life on the streets of Toronto will be able to do the same with his inspiring demons. He always starts to cry just before he starts throwing punches. A promising not sign or not, it's hard to tell. But in any case, even without the commercial galleries and auction houses, his graphic works situate him in, within an illustrious canon of boundary-breaking artists that include, among others, Jean-Michel Basquiat. Kukana's own aesthetic universe, however, replete with gritty vibrancy, frenetic color, and unique visual language suffused with pop cultural references is entirely his own. Thank you. Questions for Richard? You might take a moment to explain who Flippin' Uncle Charlie is. Uh, most, of the car most of the carvings that Kukana does are done at David Abrahams, who lives about what, 60 miles north of Toronto. And they're sort of a friend of the family up there referred to as Uncle Charlie, and Floyd can't stand him. So the actual name of the painting is Fucking Uncle Charlie. <laughs> there was a question? Yeah. Are all of the paintings you showed sold? No. Uh, many, of, uh, many of the ones that I showed are available. Uh, we have a, a slideshow over here that have ones that are for sale although three of the ones have already been sold. The ones that are the size of the ones on the table, uh, Aaron Boyd is currently selling at $550, of which would go to the Inuit Art Society. Yeah, you may recognize, recognize this one from the talk, for example. Uh, and, and in terms of time, are any of the pieces he works on long in developing, or are they all rather Fast. Oh, this is this is what's fascinating. He spends way more time on the paintings than he does on the carvings. As Elliot will tell you, he can whip out a carving instantly. He labors over these things. Elliot. So, if you were sitting here, tell us what you would say about your whole presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Uh, I, 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 on Friday, we took a photograph of a little setup that I had in, in the shop, and I sent it to Aaron Boyd. Aaron Boyd printed it out on a 11 by 17 inch sheet and showed it to Kukana, who showed up rarely sober, 
and he was holding it in front of him to be just beaming. <laughs> Finally, a little bit of attention. <laughs> so, but he, he, uh, he's extremely not articulate. Okay, so when so when Dwight asks him questions or anything about what does this mean? Shit. So 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 a few, just a very few of them are given titles by Kuptana. Okay. Most of them are given titles by Aaron Boy, but with Kuptana there, and he says, oh, he just chuckles and smiles and nods his head. Uh, very like Eli Shandwalik, actually. You ask him what something is, he'll give you a little hint, and you can guess it which, which direction he goes in your mind. You don't know whether you got it from him or not. So very similar. But I want to say, is there or will be uh, there be a book on this? Uh, publishing in color is almost impossible. Publish on Inuit art is almost impossible. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I haven't given that any thought. Well, I didn't necessarily say you, I say anybody else who might be interested. The gallery itself might have an angel. Uh, what Floyd needs is an angel that uh -huh. can give him a permanent space where he can paint. Okay. And carve. And carve. And whatever else strikes his fancy. So, I yeah. mean, so sometimes he paints on his own and the stuff isn't very good. And then the quality of the stuff is all over the place. Uh, he works best on painting at the art first gallery in a group where he's kind of encouraged by other people and gets feedback. So I've actually seen the two different versions of it, you know, things that he will bring in that he's done on his own, just desperate for money, and they're not very good. Whereas the better ones, uh, of those, we have, we have production shots of him making some of these, so we know they were made in in the gallery arthurus and they tend to be the better ones thank you better um I, i've dealt with floyd for many years um one needs to be very brave <laughs> because there's be a nice great Heather. Pardon? be nice Heather. <laughs> yes, but, um, it's difficult to have what those of us in this room might call it a normal conversation with he um, he has a je ne sais quoi, I don't know. <laughs> it's it's difficult to converse with him. I think he communicates with all of us through his art. I think it's very difficult for him to actually converse with you and I in a normal conversation. And there is, unfortunately, because of his addiction, there's this great underlying anger and violence. And so you, you need to be prepared for that if you're going to deal with him. He, I think, has an incredible mind. And I really, really thank you, Richard, for bringing him forward to this group in particular, because many of you may want to invest in his work. And I encourage you to do that. This is the next generation, if you will. This is a man with a, an incredible mind, um, but with with serious addiction issues and anger and so and, and, and it's unlikely that the it's he's like our president he ain't gonna change i mean no and, mm -hmm. and i've known him for a number of years and the pictures of him in richard's presentations are pretty scary to see what a scrawny little guy he is yeah i mean he's he's not at all well carl the, the state of things what you described did not much interest in galleries and the the what has there been any shift at all over time? Of, oh, is, is this the way it is currently, or he's he's been um, can I comment? Sure. He's been shown in many many galleries, and many gallery owners have have been supportive of him through the years. But it takes a certain amount of individual strength within the dealer to try to converse and deal with him. But the carvings are all over the place. Yeah, there are yeah. many, many The paintings have only been, been carried yeah. by Maslach McCoy, the gallery that went under in the Morisot fraud case. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and right. and actually, um, I think Aaron is trying to keep the better paintings as, um, I think he's waiting to see what will happen over the years with them, and he's, he's stockpiling. You hesitate and, to use the word investment? Yes. <laughs> I, I recommend it to WAG that they try to get the first painting, and they didn't do anything. Well, they're going to wait for someone to donate it, which is... Sheila? I recommend that anybody who can yeah. acquire things by him. I, I have a small sculpture that I absolutely love, and, and it's... I... It's not, it's weird, but it, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I love it. And and it wasn't really out of line in price. And, and you know, you can find them. You can find them at Walker's Auctions. You can find them in, in galleries in Canada. Um, and go for it, really. Yep. You really... Um, and how lucky are we that we have Elliot, who has one of the best direct links. Well, to Aaron, Floyd, you know. Well, Aaron took well, a I, yeah. Aaron took a couple of the best ones into Waddington's for them last year, and Waddington just said we don't want anything to do with it. And he's, I, he, and there's documentary evidence. He forwarded the email to me. We just have no interest. I think Ingo would deal with them, but Ingo does. Yeah. The the reason dealers don't want to deal with them is the anger and the physical violence that occurs, and I have been I have experienced. And it's pretty scary. Mm -hmm. okay. it, it's it's very physical, and it's it's someone who's in an addictive state of mind. Is it brilliant? Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. So I mean, th this guy Aaron Boyd is just a saint in Absolutely. dealing in saint mm -hmm. with a, dealing with this guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and even he calls the police when he needs to. Right. Yeah, he calls the police right. when he needs to. But if he, Boyd shows up drunk, they don't let him to the front door. If the front door is locked. You have to ring a bell and. <laughs> I also encourage everyone when they're in Toronto just to go to the gallery art Arcturus. It's very it's a non-commercial, they don't sell anything. So these are being sold by Aaron, who's operate you could probably tell piece it together. He's kind of operates like a one-man co-op for Floyd. <laughs> I have uh, business cards with Aaron's uh, email address on them if you want to contact him. And you can see the, the 20 that are on offer on the little slideshow we have running. And he would send photos. Yeah, he would send very good photos, yeah. yeah I was going to say, we managed to get Purpel Rain, thanks to Richard, and, and the way Richard is, and I think you can see he is very thorough and scholarly, he decided that he wanted the big painting that they had bought varnished, and it wasn't dry, but we were going to Toronto, so we went to pick it up. That's how we got to go to Aaron Boyd's house. We looked through this pile of Floyd paintings, and having gone to Northwestern, I'm a purple freak, not to mention a fan of the song Purple Rain. And I held it up and I go, any chance this is for sale? <laughs> and he said, you got money? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so oh, much. I, oh, go ahead. I did want to clarify one thing. I, is, is, Floyd is robustly heterosexual. I sort of left the impression with the one painting and uh, yes, he's uh, quite the ladies' man. Despite his disheveled appearances, he's the cock of the block on, on Parliament Street in, <laughs> in, in Toronto. It seems bizarre, but it is. Well, we have some ideas about that. <laughs> How, big are hands? How big are his hands? How big are his hands? That's your answer to your question. Yeah. You know what they say about guys that wear big I, shoes? I know. Big feet. Yeah. <laughs> Before this degenerates any further, it's like Richard. <laughs>